allow me to share with you today <clears throat> a few thoughts on art and beauty as explored in three different stories. These are not my stories. They come to us from the pens of some of the world's greatest writers. My first story comes from Victor Hugo and his epic novel, Les Miserables. One of my favorite passages is about the bishop who changed Jean Valjean's life forever, setting in motion the larger narrative of the book. You recall the story. <clears throat> when Valjean was released from 19 years of imprisonment, he had nowhere to go and no way to feed himself. He happened upon the home of Bishop Biavenu, or Bishop Welcome. And this bishop opened his home to Valjean, an unkempt wanderer. And he gave Valjean a hot meal next to his fire and a warm place to sleep. Then in the middle of the night, while the bishop was sleeping peacefully, Valjean sneaked out of bed, stole the bishop's silverware, the very silverware that had been used to serve him a meal just a few hours earlier, and he slipped away into the night. The police soon caught up with Valjean, and knowing where the silverware came from, they brought him back to the bishop. But instead of expressing anger or imposing shame on Valjean, the bishop told the police that they were mistaken. There was no crime here because he had given the silverware to Valjean. In turning to Valjean, he said, you left in such a hurry that you forgot to take these silver candlesticks that are on the mantle. Add those to your other silver and go forth and do the same for others. How could this be? How is it that the bishop could choose love and kindness rather than retribution? Victor Hugo gives us a glimpse into why the bishop responded this way, telling us that every summer evening, the bishop spent an extended time in his garden before going to sleep. And he describes it this way. Certainly the bishop's day was quite full to the brim of good words and good deeds. Nevertheless, it was not complete if cold or rainy weather prevented his passing an hour or two in the garden before going to bed. It seemed to be a sort of right with him to prepare himself for slumber by meditation in the presence of the grand spectacles of the nocturnal heavens. He was there alone communing with himself, peaceful, adoring, comparing the serenity of his heart with the serenity of the heavens, moved amid the darkness by the visible splendor of the constellations and the invisible splendor of God, opening his heart to the thoughts which fall from the unknown. At such moments, while he offered his heart at the hour when nocturnal flowers offer their perfume, illuminated like a lamp amid the starry night, as he poured himself out in ecstasy in the midst of universal radiance of creation, he could not have told himself probably what was passing in his spirit. He felt something take its flight from him and something descend into him mysterious exchange of the abysses of the soul with the abysses of the universe. What a beautiful picture of what it means to be ushered by beauty into the presence of the infinite. The bishop gazed upon the grand spectacle of the nocturnal heavens, and in the presence of this incomprehensible beauty, he sensed the invisible presence and splendor of God. The deepest depths of God flowed into him, melding with the deepest depths of his inner life. In the presence of beauty, 
we are connected with the very heart of God who flows into us and transforms us. We, like the bishop, are changed by beauty. When seen in this context, we realize that beauty is not an adjunct to our lives. It's not something that is reserved for our spare moments or our discretionary income. Beauty is central to our spiritual development because it creates a sacred space where we mingle with that which is greater than us and we're reminded that the light of God is present within us. All of this raises the question, well, what is beauty and how is it created? And what is it that separates the beautiful from the pretty? As my mentor and friend, Dr. Bennett Reamer stated, that which is pretty is surfacy. That is, it, it doesn't plumb the depths of our humanity. It settles for the obvious rather than searching for the subtle. Things that are pretty are saccharine and cliche ridden. But the beautiful is so well crafted, so sensitive, so imaginative that it is deeply moving and honest penetrating, insightful exploration of our life of feeling. Beauty comes to us only through the highest levels of artistic technique, which requires a lifetime of exacting study and a demanding regimen of practice that refines and hones our artistry. Beauty comes at a price. So that brings me to my second story, which comes from Norman MacLean's short novel, A River Runs Through It. This book tells the story of a family living at the junction of two great trout rivers in western Montana during the World War I era. The father is a Scot and a Presbyterian minister who shapes the lives of his two sons by teaching them the Westminster Catechism during Sunday afternoon walks in the woods, and by teaching them the art of fly fishing. For the father, any art form, especially fly fishing, requires practice, precision, and clean, exact technique. After all, the father states, all good things Trout, as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. Armed only with a fly rod that weighs just four and a half ounces, the father and his two sons wade into the deafening roar of the rushing, tumultuous Blackfoot River. As in much of literature and theology, water here is a symbol of life. In this case, the river is that deep current of our inner life, that life of feeling that flows through all of us. It is that strong, sometimes crushing current that is the bedrock of our humanity, the very definition of what it means to be human. Against this surging current, they used their finely honed fly fishing technique and their delicate fly fishing rod that is so fragile that it trembles with the very pulse of the person who holds it. As remembered by the oldest son, the father would say, remember, it is an art that is performed on a four count rhythm between 10 and two o'clock. He went on to say, as for my father, I never knew whether he believed God was a mathematician, but he certainly believed God could count, and that only by picking up God's rhythms were we able to regain power and beauty. Unlike many Presbyterians, he often used the word beauty. <laughs> Likewise, 
Our artistic technique is fragile, trembling with our very pulse. The exacting rigors of refining our technique requires hours and hours of practice to achieve the finest gradations of change, the most subtle of adjustments. Turn that foot out a little more. Rotate your shoulders, stretch the torso, lift your chin. Make that vowel a little brighter. Don't rush the beat. You're late on that entrance. You need to hear the space between the notes. Tune that chord. Why is your character using that word at that moment? And on and on we go with refining our artistic technique. Why? Because it creates beauty, which makes it possible to navigate that deep and roaring river of humanity that flows within us. That region where we know ourselves most deeply and where we know God most profoundly. Not the world of words or theories or descriptions, but the world of experience, of knowing directly through experience the deepest parts of who we are and who God is. These beautiful images remind us of the words of our Scottish Presbyterian minister who said, there is no clear line between religion and fly fishing. Said another way, there is no clear line between religion and art. This brings me to my third and final story. It comes from Marilyn Robinson's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Gilead, which is the name of a small town in Iowa that was commonly viewed as an uninspiring town from which young people fled as soon as possible. Within the borders of this sleepy town, there was a minister who was approaching the end of his life and he reflected on the beauty he found in this place that others found so dreadful. He embraced the beauty of the prairies because it allowed him to see the sunrise and the sunset unimpeded by mountains or hills. He embraced the beauty of light that lasted longer here than it did in the mountains. He listened intently to the sound of falling acorns, to the song of the crickets, and to the whisper of the wind in the trees. And he found beauty there. Here are his words. Theologians, there we go. Theologians talk about a prevenient grace that precedes grace itself and allows us to accept it. I think there must also be a prevenient courage that allows us to be brave, that is to acknowledge that there is more beauty than our eyes can bear, that precious things have been put into our hands and to do nothing to honor them is to do great harm. And therefore, this courage allows us to make ourselves useful. It allows us to be generous. Artists are those people who see beauty in unlikely places, in the unadorned, the drab, the ordinary. Every time a director begins the process of mounting a new production, they create an entirely new world on a dark and empty theater stage. And they do that because they can see beauty that we cannot yet see. A choreographer gives shape to human movement and creates a world and an energy on the stage because they see a beauty that we cannot yet see. 
The conductor looks at a musical score and hears a soundscape that others cannot yet hear. Artists are people of generosity because they give us gifts that change us. Further, these visionary artists bring us together and unite us with a common artistic experience. How many times have we rushed into a performance hall or an auditorium just before the performance begins, anxious and frazzled from our stressful lives? Then as the performance unfolds before us, that anxiety melts away and we are united by the common experience of beauty, by the common journey that we are all taking. We are no longer individuals. We are a community united by an artistic event, brought together and bound together by beauty. We have become a community because someone had the courage to embrace their artistic vision bring it into being, and share it with others. That takes intelligence, vision, and courage. The arts are not for the faint of heart. If there's any place in this world where the arts should flourish and where the life-affirming and life-changing work of the arts should thrive, It's on the campus of a faith-based liberal arts university. For it's here that we gather as a community of people who work at our artistic technique and our academic understanding of the arts. We have the privilege of working with students in that fertile frame of time when they are evolving into professional artists and into fully orbed human beings. If we say we offer a transformative education, and I believe we do, and if faith is to be fully integrated into the inner life of our students, and I believe it should, there's no more powerful way to live out that mission than within the context of a liberal arts education that fully embraces and supports the arts. I'm grateful for the opportunity I have been given to work with my colleagues, to carve out a space on this campus where the arts can be pursued at the level of artistry that makes it possible to create true beauty, life-changing beauty, transformative beauty, community-building beauty. Is art easy? No. Is it cheap? (laughs) No. Is it necessary? Yes. Is it essential to a meaningful and flourishing life? Yes, yes, and yes. So let's return to where we started, to Les Miserables and to Bishop Welcome, that humble and beauty-seeking servant of God who extends God's love to all whom he meets. Here is one final image of the bishop for us to ponder. He seated himself on a wooden bench with his back against a decrepit vine. He gazed at the stars, past the puny and stunted silhouettes of his fruit trees. This quarter of an acre, so poorly planted, so encumbered with mean buildings and sheds, was dear to him and satisfied his wants. What more was needed by this old man who divided the leisure of his life, where there was so little leisure, between gardening in the daytime and contemplation at night? Was not this narrow enclosure with the heavens for a ceiling sufficient to enable him to adore God and his most divine works. Does not this comprehend all, in fact? And what is there left to desire beyond it? A little garden in which to walk and immensity in which to dream. 
at one's feet that which can be cultivated and plucked overhead, that which one can study and meditate upon. Some flowers on the earth and all the stars in the sky. May we never lose sight of the stars, the rivers, the prairies, and the arts. All are sources of beauty, places where God is waiting to meet us, not so much to save our souls, but to grow our souls, to give us a richer life on earth and a glimpse of the eternal. May it be so.